we'll all get a message. There we go. All right, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the APS Leaders Institute workshop on supporting APS and adult services leaders being strategic. My name is Rabaz Taha, and I am the Training Operations Supervisor for the Adult Protective Services Workforce Innovations Program. We've got our panelists here with us today who we'll introduce in just a moment. And we've also got my colleagues here, Don Gibbons McWayne and Megan Juring. So before we get started, I'm just gonna briefly go over a few housekeeping items with you all. Um, I first wanna check that everyone has access to the participant manual that was sent yesterday via email. Um, but if you don't have that handy, I am putting it in the chat box and you can just easily download it from there as well. So here's a little bit of information about the Academy for Professional Excellence, which is a project of the San Diego State School of Social Work. Uh, its mission is to provide exceptional workforce development and learning experiences for the transformation of individuals, organizations, and communities. Also, Adult Protective Services Workforce Innovations, also known as APSWE, is a program of the Academy for Professional Excellence, and its mission is to provide innovative workforce development to APS professionals and their partners. And let me see mute so we don't get any background noises. Okay. And let's move on. So before we officially get started, I'd like to introduce our land acknowledgement. So the purpose of a land acknowledgement is to recognize the relationship of indigenous peoples to the land. It is multifaceted in its meaning. It shows respect to the people of the land, to the land itself, and to the relationship to one another. They are statements that recognize the dispossession from the land, the harm brought by colonial beliefs, practices, and policies. They validate and recognize the continued presence of indigenous peoples everywhere. Lastly, when offered in earnest and with sincerity, they are the first steps in reconciliation and healing. So for millennia, um, over 100 tribal nations have been a part of this land. This land has nourished, healed, protected, and embraced them for many generations in a relationship of balance and harmony. As members of the Academy community, we acknowledge this legacy. We promote this balance and harmony. We find inspiration from this land, the land of the original inhabitants of California. We also acknowledge that making a statement isn't enough, and it's important that we share ways that we can all take action. So while developing a land acknowledgement is an important step towards reconciliation, the statement alone is not enough. It's important to identify some concrete steps and actions that can be taken. Um, so these actions can involve putting in time and research to learn more about the indigenous communities of the lands you are on, returning artifacts and land to their appropriate tribal communities, working to protect and preserve the land and much more. There is also a QR code displayed on this slide, but I'm also placing a link in the chat for more information on how you can learn and take action. It's in the chat now. So next, um, I know that many of us are now pros at navigating um, Zoom and just other online platforms. Um, so I'm gonna do a very, very brief overview of some of the functions we're gonna be using today. Um, so your mic icon allows you to mute and unmute yourself. Please make sure you're muted when others are speaking. The video icon allows you to share and unshare your camera. If you do have access to a camera, please turn it on. We would love to see your faces this morning. Um, the participant icon allows you to update your name if needed. If you see that your display name is not reflective of your name, you can easily change that in the participants tab. The chat box is where you can participate via chat um, and ask questions. We're gonna be monitoring the chat box very closely, so feel free to use that. The reactions tab allows you to share some reactions like a hand clap or a thumbs up. Lastly, we will be utilizing a breakout room today. Um, when you're in your breakout room, you are able to leave the breakout room at any time and you can also signal for assistance if needed. Also, just a few reminders um, to please attend the entire course, but if you do need to step away or log off, please go ahead and private chat me, just so, so I'm aware of that. Um, lastly, we may run into some tech glitches and we're just gonna try our best to work through them together. And I think that concludes 
most of our housekeeping. So before I hand it over to Dawn, who will go over the agenda today, I wanted to ask and see if there's any questions. If there are, feel free to unmute yourself or put it in the chat. Okay. I'm not hearing any. Sorry, I got muted. Um, I'm not hearing any questions or seeing any, so I'm going to pass it over to Dawn now. So Dawn, whenever you're ready. Great. Thank you, Ravaz. Uh, my name is Dawn Gibbons McWayne. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the program director for the Adult Protective Services Workforce Innovations Program, otherwise known as APSWE. Um, and you've met Rabaz. And then I also want um, you to meet Megan Jury. Megan is our Leaders Institute coordinator, and we're just thrilled to be here with you today um, to, um, to have you all together with us for this, for this Leaders Institute workshop. So um, why are we here? We're here today to support APS and adult services leaders. This has been um, one of the key components of the APS Leaders Institute project. Um, we're here to learn, and we're here to make connections between colleagues, which is also a really important piece of this project. The topic for today is on being strategic, and the idea is that this will build on, for those of you that attended the June workshop, this will build on the information that was presented there. So in the June workshop, we talked about the California landscape and who are the players, and now that if, um, if you have that information and if you weren't able to attend that one, we do have it recorded, um, we'd have, be happy to share that with you. Um, but so today we're wanting to build on that information and talk about um, how to be strategic in your role as an APS or an adult services leader. There have been and continue to be many, many changes happening within APS and adult services here in California. So where do you look to figure out where the fields are going? Um, some places to look have been um, the new and emerging state and federal initiatives. Um, we had the AB 135 legislation that passed that made changes to um, the emphasis on populations that APS programs serve, um, more, um, more emphasis on serving vulnerable adults and older adults that are experiencing homelessness, longer term case management. Um, we have we can see emerging uh, more interactions uh, with APS and behavioral health and um, initiatives like care court coming out, um, state and federal investments in APS training, the you know the ACL funding for APS training in the National APS Training Center and um, from CDSS the uh, we have the um, increase in ongoing APS training funds. Um, and then we are looking at possible federal guidelines for APS for the very first time. So a lot changing in, in the APS world. We've had the emergence and the evolution of the master plan for aging. So those are some of the places that we're looking to see what are the changes that are happening? What are the changes that are coming that are impacting um, APS programs in particular? So then what do you do with that information when you see when you see that um, coming through or coming up? How do you align with those initiatives and advance the needs of your APS program? Um, we'll work that. Those are the things we're going to be talking about today. So where are the opportunities for strategic alignment um, with the master plan? How and where does APS fit? Um, examples of acting strategically as a county leader and then step by step, um, some step by step information on how do you, um, in Deborah's words, take um, move from innovation, move innovation into action. So with that, a review of the agenda. So we'll have our panel presentations and I'll introduce the panel in just a moment. Then we'll be moving into breakout groups where there's gonna be an opportunity to reflect and talk about the information that you've heard and um, how you might apply it in your role and um, connecting and um, exchanging contact information with your other colleagues. We'll debrief and then we'll um, get your evaluation input. If you've attended our workshops before, you know how important your feedback is to us. We really want to know what worked, what didn't, what do you want more of and less of to make this most meaningful for you. Um, and then we will have a closing. One of the things that's a bit different this time is um, we're going to ask, we're asking you to please ask questions as we go along. The 
the panelists here would really like to hear your questions as, as they're moving through so that we can, again, make sure that this information really um, connects with you and is meaningful and you get what you need out of it. So um, you can feel free to come off mute or put your questions in the chat and we'll be watching the chat and then um, feeding those questions to the panelists. So with that, I wanna introduce you to our wonderful panelists here. Uh, first up will be Jackie Tompkins. Um, Jackie is a senior strategist for the California Master Plan for Aging at the California Department of Aging. And then next, Jill Nielsen will be presenting. Jill is the Deputy Director of Programs for the Department of Aging and Adult Services, Human Services Agency, City and County of San Francisco. And then Deborah Bates will be coming on. Deborah is the Interim Director of County of Orange Healthcare Agency. So with that, I will turn things over to you, Jackie. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for the warm welcome and thanks for spending the morning with us. Um, as Don shared, my name is Jackie Tompkins. I work at the California Department of Aging, specifically on the master plan for aging. So I work internally within our department as well as externally to advance our state's master plan for aging, which essentially is a strategic and bold vision aimed at building communities, systems, and policies for all ages and all abilities through multi-sector partnerships and person-centered investments. Next slide. I'm going to um, do a little bit of an overview of the, um, the upcomings of the Master Plan for Aging, how it came to be. I'm going to share some highlights on some of the recent successes with the Master Plan for Aging. And then I also wanted to share specifically where APS fits into the Master Plan for Aging and some of the initiatives um, that are geared towards that particular topic, because I know that's what we're focused on today. So next slide. So first to get us started, just want to talk a little bit about the what drove us having a master plan for aging. And it really is this acknowledgement and recognition that aging is changing in California and it's changing in Cal um, and it's changing the way California operates and it also is changing the way California needs to provide services, resources, and supports. California's older adult population is the fastest growing population group. In fact, by the, age, by the year 2030, nearly 11 million Californians will be an older adult, and this is one-fourth of the state's population. On the next slide, you'll see that these um, population growth for older adults is across the state. So um, I know that there are several of you on this call that are um, from local regions, so I did want to share this slide just to highlight um, your specific area and the projected population growth for um, individuals 65 and over. So the growth in the numbers and also the growth in the diversity presents challenges, but also pre presents opportunities for us. And the Master Plan for Aging is really a, a way in which we can do proactive thinking, planning, and action. And that's where our Master Plan comes into play. Next slide. I'll talk a little bit about the development of the Master Plan for Aging. Some of you on this call may be familiar with the development, Other of you, others of you may be less familiar. So I thought this foundational information would be helpful to get us started. So on the next slide, the development and outcome of, of the Master Plan for Aging reflects a lot of key milestones. It wasn't necessarily something that just happened, but rather there were a lot of um, support, a lot of interest, and a lot of action taken to get us to where we are today. And I just want to call out a few of these on the slide, and namely Governor Newsom's executive order, which called for the California Health and Human Services Agency to convene a cabinet-level work group for aging to advise on the development and release of the MPA, and also Senate Bill 228, which identified the California Department of Aging as a lead convener and administrator of the MPA, and also required us to submit an annual report so we could be accountable on the goals, strategies, and initiatives identified in the plan. On the next slide, I wanna share with you that the Master Plan for Aging was released in January of 2021. 
So it looks like um, shortly we will be turning, what is that, three years old? Four? No, three years old <laughs> come January of 2023. And it really serves as that strategic vision for the state. And under the Master Plan for Aging, we have five bold goals. And these five bold goals focus on housing, healthcare, inclusion and equity, caregiving, and affordable aging. And the five bold goals are going to stay consistent throughout the 10-year um, duration of this particular iteration of the Master Plan for Aging. And there's also 23 strategies that support each of these uh, five bold goals. The goals and strategies stay the same. However, every other year, so every two years, we look at the initiatives that support the bold goals as well as the strategies. And having the initiatives be revisited on a continuous basis allows us to reflect upon past initiatives, um, redefine or even rejuvenate initiatives. So there's that um, ability to be responsive, nimble and flexible with the master plan for aging to not only address the current needs of older adults and people with disabilities, but also those emerging needs and the future needs of older adults, people with disabilities and their caregivers. Next slide. The master plan for aging really reflects the whole of government approach in which leaders across our state and administration are taking action to better communicate coordinate and transform services and supports across the lifespan. Again, we have talked about that our um, issues that we uh, work on for older adults, people with disabilities and caregivers are complex and so are the solutions. So we really need this collective group of leaders, um, decision makers, aligning and integrating to really achieve those policies and systems change. Next slide. I wanted to talk a little bit more about the master plan for aging serving as a living document. It really is intended to be that. I talked about how every two years we refresh, update, and renew the initiatives. The while CDA is definitely a lead convener and organizer of the master plan for aging, there is definitely shared ownership across the administration, various agencies, and various departments to ensure that we are delivering and producing outcomes. On the next slide, it outlines a little bit more about those five bold goals that I talked about. And even though we update the initiatives that support these goals every two years, it doesn't mean that those prior initiatives simply go away. We build upon them, we refresh them, and we um, revise them. This year, we're really focused on um, having our initiatives focus on delivering results, analyze, and communicating change. On this next slide, I wanna just share with you a few of the initiatives that are really cross-cutting within our master plan for aging that you might be interested in. Um, for example, initiative 18, we're really looking at um, understanding long-term services and support benefits. We also are um, doing a roadmap in partnership with DHCS to talk about home and community-based services. We're exploring options here in California about having a no wrong door state leadership council, as well as a system. We understand that um, it can be challenging to navigate the various resources and services that are available at the state level, as well as the local level. So we are exploring opportunities to streamline that, again, for older adults, people with disabilities, and their caregivers. And recently, just this past summer slash fall, we did um, release California's first ever statewide baseline consumer satisfaction survey. And to my understanding, we'll be able to share the results of that um, survey later on this fall slash winter. And another initiative that I thought you all might be interested in is Initiative 83, which is focused on um, developing a statewide caregiver equity roadmap and strategy. On the next slide, um, I wanted to highlight some specific um, initiatives that focus on our MPA Goal 3, where I feel that most of the work that, um, my apologies, uh, most of the work that um, APS providers um, 
support under goal three strategy E, which is protection from abuse, neglect, and exploitation. So there are four distinct initiatives underneath this particular strategy. For example, initiative 66 is about um, developing resources to build capacity among California's legal service providers to serve older adults, people with disabilities, to prioritize equity and the rights of older adults and people with disabilities. We also have an initiative that's focused on um, APS resources. So this is about providing resources to all 58 adult services, all 58 county adult services programs to facilitate financial institution reporting potential financial abuse to county APS offices across the state. We also have one that's focused on APS training. So training APS social workers on how to assess an individual's de decision-making abilities and then also one focused on probate guardian, guardianship funding, which is initiative 69, which is focused on exploring dedicated funding opportunities for probate guardianship um, with caseload standards based on acuity levels. So I chose these ones to highlight specifically for your group because I know that you're having um, strategic discussions today about how to align your work with some of the initiatives within California's master plan for aging. Next slide. Just to illustrate um, the point that um, initiatives from previous years simply don't go away, I did wanna share with you that one of the initiatives from the past prior years is called California 2020, 2030. And here at the California Department of Aging, we really lean into our local partners, the area agencies on aging to provide services, resources, and supports. So we are connecting with our California Aging Network to survey them and understand how we can be, again, more proactively prepared to support the larger um, and older growing demographics um, here in California. Some areas that we're focused on include um, funding sources and capacities, understanding unique geographies and demographics, governance, understanding if um, people are aware of the services of the triple A's. Okay. And next slide. The MPA is also driving results. So I did wanna share with you with um, the next couple of slides for each of the five goals, um, some of the successes that we have seen along the way uh, in terms of the master plan for aging being that strategic vision that brings people together um, to have that collective impact. So for on the next slide, you'll see for goal one, um, which is housing for all ages and stages. Within this goal area, we are building capacity for housing and services to prevent homelessness. And this is an initiative led out of our Department of California Department of Social Services. On the next slide, we have goal two. Again, here we are looking um, in partnership with um, other departments, including the Department of Healthcare Services. We are expanding healthcare affordability and access. We are investing in home and community-based services, and we are also investing in Alzheimer's early interventions. For goal three, there have been numerous successes in this area. This includes um, build, building that, uh, bridging that digital divide, providing access to technology and resources, establishing our aging and disability resource connection centers, and also um, with the most recent passing of the state's budget, we were, um, the California Department of Aging was also awarded $50 million to focus on older adult behavioral health. And that is going to go towards local grants as well as a, a media campaign to elevate the importance of this topic for our older adult population. Hi, Jackie, this is Megan. I just wanted to call your attention to a question that came in the chat. Is MPA generating this new funding like for housing, APS training, et cetera, or is it just capturing information in one place on what has come into existence in the last few years through other initiatives and bills? So the MPA is a, a combination of things. Um, it's not necessarily 
um, reflected to design new programs, new services, or new resources, but rather it is also a way for us to think differently about the existing progress, programs, services, and resources, and how we can collectively um, align those better, integrate those better, and also communicate um, and streamline those better. Um, some of these investments um, definitely reflect the impact that we have seen in the MPA, but not all of them. So it's not always designed to create new, but rather build upon and strengthen existing in addition to building upon. So I hope that covers that. And then under goal four, um, which is caregiving that works. Um, caregivers are really the backbone of um, supporting older adults and people with disabilities. And so there are a lot of investments and trainings underway in which in-home supportive um, services workers, IHSS workers, are receiving trainings um, and also stipends for their work. And then under goal five, which is really focused on affordable aging, um, we have made record investments in senior nutrition to expand CalFresh, um, home delivered meals, um, expand congregate dining options, and really create an infrastructure so there's more options for meal preparation and delivery, again, with that CalFresh, um, that CalFresh program. And so on this next slide, just sharing that all in all, when we look at the collective investments that have been made um, throughout the state, we're looking at $9.5 billion across um, Cali California and the five bold goals. So that is, I think, whew, that's amazing. Okay. Um, the California Department of Aging, who um, is a lead convener of the Master Plan for Aging, really is able to do and advance the work of the master plan through robust stakeholder engagement. When the plan was originally released in 2021, it was guided by several stakeholders and partners who really came together and identified what should we be focusing on together. And again, it, it remains um, the stakeholder engagement process that we have for this particular master plan for aging remains active, remains um, robust and really meaningful to the work that we're doing. For example, last year before on the next slide, last year before releasing the um, new initiatives that we were going to focus on, we held a California for All Ages and Abilities Day of Action. And so numer I think there were over 500 people who attended this event, as well as um, leaders across our state and our administration. And individuals at this meeting were able to um, tell directly, um, inform the state what type of priorities, what concerns that they had for the state of California and also think through what would be some of the solutions. On the next slide, you'll see that um, we also have very organized um, MPA stakeholder committees. Um, we have about six of them. So we have um, committees that advise us on Alzheimer's disease. We have a research partnership. We have an equity advisory committee, a disability and aging community living advisory committee. And so these groups meet um, pretty much on a quarterly basis. And even if you are not a member of a particular committee, the committee meeting, um, the committee meetings are open to the public. So you are very much um, able to attend and share your perspectives and thoughts during the public comment period. Um, one committee that I wanna focus on a little bit more is our Elder and Disability Justice Coordinating Council. So if you don't mind going to the next slide. As I organize myself here. And I wanted to focus on this one um, a little bit more, just given again, the topics and the audience that we have today. And so the development of California's Elder and Disability Justice Coordinating Council was a, a specific initiative that was put forth when the Master Plan for Aging was originally released in 2021. So it, the Master Plan for Aging called for the creation of this coordinating council. As elder justice is a core priority in the plan because we definitely want to 
safeguard the rights and well-being of older adults and adults with disabilities. Um, the Coordinating Council um, is um, supported by the California Department of Aging. We have a staff member that oversees and supports this committee. And the council is really designed to increase coordination efforts, develop recommendations to prevent and address abuse, neglect, exploitation, and fraud um, against older adults and people with disabilities. And they also have um, three unique subcommittees. So they're also focused on a conservatorship work group. They have a legal services work group and an adult protective services work group. So if there are one of those that interest you or you're wanting to learn more about one of those, um, feel free to contact me and I'll direct you to our staff member who oversees this particular council as well as the work groups. Um, so um, this is definitely a way for you to also get involved. And so in closing, I just wanted to share with all of you on the next slide, um, as a California resident myself, I'm incredibly proud of California continuing to lead the way. Um, we get numerous calls from other states who are looking to develop their own multi-sector master plans for aging um, for their own state. And we are happy to work with them, talk about the importance of stakeholder engagement, talk about the why behind um, our specific goals. And we have across the nation about 26 other states that are looking to do what California is doing. And so I just want to um, commend all of you because we see each one of you who are on this call as a part of the implementation and success for the Master Plan for Aging. And so I look forward to working with each of you and hearing the rest of today's dialogue. And I hope this provided you an overview of the Master Plan for Aging and where APS fits in. So thank you for your time. That's Jackie. Um, so we've got uh, some time for additional questions if you all have them. Um, so please feel free to put your questions in the chat or raise your hand or come off mute. Um, while you all are thinking about your questions and getting ready to ask, Jackie, you had mentioned that if folks would like to participate in the, um, the APS uh, work group, uh, what, that they could get in contact with you. Is it okay if we share your email address? We can put that in the chat. Yeah, please um, contact me. The um... And I would probably have to work with the staff member about the composition of such committee. You may have to be a council member to be a part of the subcommittee, but public members can also join the larger council um, meetings that are hold, held on a quarterly basis. So I can also put that a link into the chat. Um, some of the so, subcommittees and committees for the MPA operate a little bit differently. So I just want to ensure that I'm providing um, accurate information. But I know that the larger committee me meetings themselves, the quarterly ones, are definitely open for um, the public to listen to as well as provide public comment. So would that be the Elder and Disability Justice Coordinating Council? Yes. And um, okay. at each of those meetings, too, we just had one actually last week. Um, the various work groups that I talked about, they do report outs on their specific um, areas that they're focused on, as well as recommendations. So I'm going to put the Coordinating Council's website um, in the chat. We are just working on getting the, the 2024 calendar um, like meeting dates updated on the web page. So stay tuned for that. That should be happening in a couple of weeks. So it sounds like if I'm understanding correctly, if folks want to get involved, um, the best place to start would be with the Elder and Disability Justice Coordinating Council to start there. Correct. And then, and then um, 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 members, that is absolutely correct on. And then membership for this actual council um, goes every two years, I believe, for this one, this particular one. And so as those opportunities um, for recruitment come to be, there's opportunities to apply to be on the council as well. And so on this website, you can hear about, um, there's past meeting materials and resources. So 
um, you're able to listen and learn from some of the past meetings as well. We just, again, had one last week. And so you probably won't have another one until February. So there's a good amount of time to get caught up. Um, and thank you, Ramaz, for putting this uh, slide back up. So it looks like we do have the email address here for the engage at aging.ca.gov. Would that be the best place for folks um, if they want more information or have questions? Absolutely. That one is monitored on a regular basis, and we will um, be able to share it with the, the staff member here at CDA who oversees this council and can provide a little bit more detail on that particular group. Um, and then I know there's also the, the distribution list for the the email um, distribution list for the master plan, and um, they send out regular updates about meetings that um, open meetings um, that folks can attend if if they're interested. Yeah, I will locate that link and um, share that as well in the chat. I highly recommend if you're interested in any of the work that's coming out of um, the California Department of Aging and also the master plan for aging that you sign up to be a part of this listserv. So I just found it. So I'm gonna throw that in the chat as well. Great, thank you. Really great resources coming through in the chat. Any questions? I don't see any questions so far in the chat. Um, do you all have any questions before we, we move to the next presenter? All right, I don't see anything coming up. Or Boz and Megan, if I'm missing anything, let me know. And what I might um, put in the chat really quick, just as um, follow-up resources, I, I'll put in the direct link to the 2023-2024 um, priority initiatives for the MPA. And then we also launched last year a uh, MPA implementation tracker. So you're able to look at specifically some of these initiatives that I talked to related to APS, whether it's you know number 68, uh, 67, you can type in an area of interest and kind of get a status update from um, you know the various agencies that serve as the lead for um, that particular initiative. So I'll put those resources in the chat as well for those of you on the call. Oh, great, that's very helpful. Thank you so much, Jackie. Okay, and now we'll move forward to our next presenter, our very own Jill Nielsen. Thanks so much, Dawn. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I am going to start off my uh, presentation by doing something that you're not supposed to do when you present, which is to let you all know that I'm, I'm not an expert on um, how to be strategic. Um, like many of you, I have a master's in social work, not an MBA or other uh, formal training that you know might prepare prepare me to, to speak about you know strategy. But I really appreciated the opportunity um, to reflect in preparation for this presentation on ways that I have been strategic in the you know almost two decades that I've been working in county government. Um, and I invite all of you to be thinking about examples from your work history um, about. Uh, initiatives or techniques that you have implemented uh, in your own county or perhaps at the state or regional level um, where you have been able to, to be strategic. So um, next slide, please. What I'm going to do is talk through a few um, techniques um, to some characteristics for being strategic um, and then provide a few examples of initiatives that, um, that I have worked on. Um, and again, invite your, your questions and comments and, and hopefully you're thinking also about um, what you've done in your past or what you may wanna be doing um, moving forward. So um, it's really important when you are trying to be strategic that you have a vision and that you are making a plan. Um, and that vision um, can be bold, it can be as large as the master plan for aging or it can be something much smaller, uh, whether you want to end homelessness or whether you want to simply enhance your home safe program, um, you need to have a vision for where it is that you want to go, what that looks like, um, and then you've got to create um, a plan. And the plan doesn't have to be 
a detailed um, strategic plan. And I've got a, my agency strategic plan here. Um, and, and strategic planning processes, uh, which I'm sure all of you have, have gone, gone through at one point in, or another, are very helpful. Um, but that's, um, that's not always required um, for you to try to uh, be strategic, to improve the programs that you're operating, um, to improve your collaborations with um, stakeholders, to grow your resources. You can do it on a much smaller level as well. Next slide, please. But what is really important in government, I think you'll all agree, is that you take the long view. We know that in government change does not happen overnight. Um, and when I'm thinking about the long view, I'm you know, you're thinking about multi-year plans. Um, I have had the pleasure of working with some very dynamic people um, who may be newer to government, and they can often get frustrated by the slow, slow pace and how long it can take for us to, to grow our programs. Um, to make changes that maybe in nonprofit sectors may happen at a, um, overnight or in a couple of weeks, it can take us months to years. Um, and so I think that's really important um, to be thinking about. So, and, and to be creating a plan and biting off a piece of your plan um, for each year. Next slide, please. If, Focusing on one aspect of your plan is what's gonna keep it manageable, achievable, um, and what's also going to keep you motivated. Um, we have to create realistic goals for ourselves, for our teams. What can we realistically accomplish in, in, this, in this year, for example? That's always been very helpful for me is to be thinking about what is it that I'm gonna be accomplishing in this fiscal year? And some of the, the plans that I make are gonna work out, some do not. Really important to be creating a project. Um, if you want to actually move forward with a plan, um, you have to have an actual initiative that you can be working on where you can be inviting others to join you to work on it. You know, perhaps your, your vision might be to enhance staff morale among your APS team. In order to accomplish this, you're going to need to develop a plan, and that plan is probably going to be very multifaceted. You know, it might include um, reducing caseloads for staff, which you may need to hire more staff in order to reduce caseloads. It may be providing more professional development opportunities for staff, um, or even um, improving the building um, where, where your staff are located. So there's a lot of different facets that can go into um, a vision like improving morale. You need to break it down and focus on one aspect at a time. Um, and by creating a project, um, you're gonna allow others to really join in, join your endeavor. A project might be, for example, um, working on a staff development day or um, developing a survey where you can gather input. Those are all tangible tasks that you can carry out in, in start to build some enthusiasm. Next slide, please. Because it's really gonna be important that you build engagement, that you garner the support from others around you, whether that's um, other stakeholders, nonprofits, um, or whether it's simply um, others, other leaders in your department who can help you to champion your effort. And I know Deborah is gonna be talking um, a little bit more about that, as well as the importance of developing a consistent message, which is really important if you're trying to keep your, your the engagement of others going. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna provide just a, a few examples of, of how you can be uh, strategic at um, the local level, regional level, and state level. Um, and so, you know, what, one example from my own work history is with um, the multidisciplinary team um, that San Francisco's APS program uh, coordinates in collaboration with a local nonprofit, the Institute on Aging. Um, and we have had an elder abuse forensic center, that is our multidisciplinary team, it's been the primary team that we've had for many years. Um, and as you probably know, multidisciplinary teams for adult protective services are attended by a range of partners. Um, 
public guardian, behavioral health, um, as well as criminal justice partners. Um, and what we found um, a problem that we encountered years ago was that we had so many situations, cases of self-neglect that were being brought forward to our MDT that our criminal justice partners, the SF for us, San Francisco Police Department, the district attorney's office, um, and in victim services with, associated with the, the district attorney's office, they were just bored. Um, they were having to sit through these cases um, of self-neglect that really didn't have any criminal justice aspect to them. Um, and we were worried about losing them. Um, and back then we were also meeting in person and uh, parking in San Francisco is kind of a bear as you probably know. So we were really struggling to keep them attending our meetings. So um, we leveraged um, some small amount of new funding that came to us through our office, um, our AAA, our Area Agency on Aging. And we were able to um, create a high risk self-neglect meeting. Um, we later were able to leverage some of the pandemic stimulus funding um, to keep that going. Um, and now we're actually, um, we've been able to build that, that particular um, additional meeting into the, um, the IOA's budget. So we now have a very vibrant, thriving, high-risk self-neglect meeting. Um, our goal when we created the meeting was not about creating a new forum for self-neglect. We were really just trying to keep our partners, criminal justice partners engaged. Um, so we do have separate MDT meetings now. We have an elder abuse forensic center where we're dealing with cases of abuse by others. Um, and we have the high-risk self-neglect meeting, which actually has tremendous participation. Um, we now have a whole range of homeless services providers um, that are attending the high-risk self-neglect meeting, which has been um, a really, really positive outcome for us. But keeping partners engaged is a very important part of being strategic at the local level. Um, another example that occurred, occurred to me was um, when you receive a new mandate, make sure that you leverage the opportunity um, to grow your program, to enhance the, the resources that you have available to you. Um, and and pre-pandemic um, in San Francisco, some of you may remember that there was a pilot program. There, this was state legislation that allowed San Francisco, as well as San Diego and LA counties, to implement a new form of LPS conservatorship. Um, well, ultimately only San Francisco implemented this um, conservatorship program, this pilot. San Diego and LA did not end up following suit. And um, it was a, a heavy, heavy lift um, at the time to develop this new pilot program for a, a variety of reasons. Um, and what we were really testing out was a, um, a new eligibility requirement outside of grave disability, um, if you know anything about LPS conservatorship. But my point in, in bringing this up is, is really not to talk about LPS conservatorship, but rather um, that this was a new mandate. Um, the timing was not, um, was not ideal as it, I don't know that it ever is um, when you receive a new mandate, but I was able to um, grow my uh, public conservator, the team that oversees and operates our LPS conservatorships. And um, at the end of the day, the, the pilot didn't work out. Um, we actually only had a handful of um, cases, literally one handful of cases in uh, our multi-year <laughs> endeavor. Um, and um, not a pro pilot program that will be replicated. But the resources that I was able to secure during that time, uh, they're still with the program. Um, and we really need them. Program is very busy. Um, and so leverage an opportunity to secure additional resources through that, that mandate. And maybe some of you had that same um, situation when the APS expansion happened very recently in California. Next slide, please. Hi, hi, Jill. This is Megan. I just wanted to get you um, between slides to follow up on a question that came in from the chat relating to the Great. MDTs. Okay. Um, do you have specific people that consistently attend MDTs or are participants case specific? So we do have um, a range of partner agencies that are the um, core members of the MDT 
We actually complete um, MOUs and confidentiality agreements with those partners every single year. Um, and that's why for us having a nonprofit, the Institute on Aging, to coordinate, host, and staff those meetings is really critically important. Um, they uh, ensure that the MDTs are well um, attended and that partner organizations are um, having, that they send a representative um, every single meeting. Uh, it's really helpful that we now have Zoom meetings. Attendance is, is much easier for our partner organizations now that we do virtual meetings. Um, and we also, though, will invite case-specific individuals. So if there is a case manager, for example, from a specific group, we'll make sure to invite that individual um, for that uh, specific meeting. So thank you for the question. Any other questions, Megan? None that are in the chat right now, but we could take a brief pause in case someone wants to raise their hand. Okay, thank you. Um, so at the regional level, um, so in 2018, uh, the Bay Area Social Services Consortium um, formed an adult services committee. And the Bay Area Social Services Consortium um, is the primary university county partnership for us in the Bay Area. And I know that across the state, I. Um, there are other university county level partnerships. I think um, Cassie is one that may be in the, um, uh, the Central Valley area. And I know that there's another group and forgetting the acronym out of um, Southern California as well. Well, the um, Bay Area Social Services Consortium, um, in addition to operating an executive leadership program uh, for county um, staff in the Bay Area, they also staff and support um, a range of committee meetings. Um, and there has historically been a meeting for um, children's services, for individuals that work on the fiscal and budget side. Um, there had not been one of these com a committee for adult services. And um, the, our agency directors you know, um, recognized that there were increasing needs in the adult services forum. And so they um, asked BAS to support a new committee, the adult services committee. And it was really exciting for adult services directors to come together um, to be able to work on strengthening our programs. Um, and really our primary focus was to strengthen um, our workforce. And that's really where we were able to partner in a very, um, um, intentional way with our university partners, um, primary um, uh, key stakeholders when you're really thinking about how to create a pipeline of trained adult services, social workers um, to staff um, our growing programs. But when our group got together, we were really struggling initially to figure out a direction. You know, how do we move forward? We knew where we wanted to go, um, but how do you actually get there? And so um, we had um, the opportunity um, that we had seized on um, to work with CDSS um, around an APS Innovations grant. Um, and in the, you know, the MSW stipend program for APS is really an initiative that um, I think I had heard for the, you know, since I started in adult services almost 20 years ago, um, you know, why doesn't APS have uh, a commensurate program like Title 40? And many of you may have come from child welfare. Um, some of you may have even started your career through the Title 40 program. Um, and those of us in APS um, long wish to have a similar incentive that would bring individuals um, that would support their, um, their ability to, to pursue an MSW and to work in adult protective services. So it was really um, exciting to be able to partner with CDSS um, and to um, pull together small amounts of funding um, from each county to be able to provide matching money for CDSS to pursue the um, an innovations grant from the Administration for Community Living. 
And so this was a project that brought our um, adult services committee together. Um, we gave us something tangible to work on. Um, and we were successful in um, securing really small amounts of funding from each of our counties that we used as matching funding. CDSS secured this um, federal grant and we were able to operate a very, very small demonstration project. We had 10 MSW recipients um, over two years. Um, and this was ended up being right in the middle of the pandemic that this demonstration project um, rolled forward. But it was really um, exciting for, for our group. It brought us together, it grounded us. Um, and since that time, we have been able to work on more, on loftier, bigger picture projects. Um, and in fact, we now, that same group, um, then worked with UC Berkeley to um, develop a much broader, bolder um, strategic plan. And I've got it here. I can send everybody the link of the strategic plan if you're interested, but I will tell you that this document, what it has is a whole lot of very overwhelming goals. Um, it creates a roadmap, um, and this is really a multi-year roadmap for us. Um, to be able to strengthen adult services across the Bay Area. And we think that there are also a, um, a lot of components of our strategic plan that apply um, to other regions in the state as well. And what's been really exciting though from this strategic plan is that um, similar to the master plan for aging, you know, if you build it, others will come. And by creating this strategic plan, we have now garnered enthusiasm support from other stakeholders, including um, the Child Family Policy Institute of California. And they have now committed to supporting the oper um, supporting our committee to create an operational plan, um, a plan that is um, uh, that breaks down our lofty goals into achievable um, action items. So we are currently working with them to create that action plan um, and CFPIC, has let us know that they are um, wanting to work with us to implement this plan. And their goal ultimately is to use this particular project, our plan, um, and then take it statewide so that they can carry out the same framework, the same um, strategy with other regions in the state, which is, um, which is really, really exciting. Next slide, please. And then of course, you know, we can use strategy um, at the state level um, and really appreciate Jackie being here. I think that today um, counties are partnering with CDA, with CDSS in ways that we really have not done before. Um, it feels like we're really moving forward um, together in collaboration and trying to align our goals. And the Elder Disability Justice Coordinating Council that Jackie was speaking about really allows us to have a unified voice and it provides an opportunity for our partner organizations to, um, to really say what we've known all along, that our programs need additional resources, we need additional state leadership, um, and that our programs matter because, because of the population growing. Um, and that we play a really important part in, um, in the safety net as um, uh, we operate adult protective services and thinking about the public guardian in particular. And so the, um, the Elder Disability Justice Coordinating Council can allow you at the local level the opportunity to demonstrate to your board or to your, um, your department head or your agency head, see, we need to do, we need to follow the master plan for aging's lead. Um, we see here that the state is saying that we need to create a playbook um, locally so that we can be strengthening adult services and strengthening um, the, the range of supports that adults with disabilities and older people need in order to be able to thrive in the community. So it really can provide you at the local level with a platform um, to be able to advocate for your programs. But additionally, um, the, uh, the Master Plan for Aging and, and, and really thinking about the Elder Disability Justice Coordinating Council allows us an opportunity 
to be thinking about um, and to be strategic in the way that we're pushing forward state legislation. And of course, um, uh, we, we use the County Welfare Directors Association um, to support and carry our message forward. Um, and we're really fortunate to have such wonderful partners within CWDA. And I know one of the things that I have learned from CWDA over the years is that if we're pursuing legislation, we really need to be aligning with state priorities. Um, and HomeSafe is an example of, of a successful proposal that, the, that CWDA carried forward on our behalf. And of course it resonated with the state because homelessness and pre homeless prevention services um, are really, really key in order to addressing our, the crisis that we have of individuals who are un, unhoused or at risk of becoming homelessness. So using the state legislative um, process to move forward um, our priorities, aligning our proposals with state priorities is another way that we can be strategic. Next slide, please. And so Dawn um, referenced earlier um, the proposed federal rule that the Administration for Community Living has recently released for Adult Protective Services. Um, and I think that it's really, today is a great moment for us to be thinking through how can we use this opportunity to our advantage? How can we be strategic um, to enhance our Adult Protective Services program through this new proposed federal rule? I know some people are, who may, and especially I've heard from colleagues in child welfare or who started out in child welfare, uh-oh, federal oversight, what will this mean for us? And I think that that really strengthens the need for us to be engaging in um, this moment in time um, and to be thinking through what can we do to be enhancing our program. So um, hopefully, you know, during some of the breakouts, we can be thinking through um, the proposed federal rule as well as other ways that we can be um, working together, collaborating with stakeholders, pushing forward our message, creating a plan, creating a vision um, to enhance our programs. So thank you, that's all that I have. I'm happy to take any questions or... And Raboz, if you go to the next slide, my um, contact information is there. Yep, I see Emily's hand up. Hi, Emily. Hey, so I'm curious, do you do you see that the proposed rules as an opportunity to ask from the federal government for more money for APS? Is that kind of part of what you're suggesting that we could do? Yeah, well, and there will be modest funding um, coming at this moment. Um, you know, my understanding is very modest. I don't know what that will be at the local level once it's broken down, but absolutely. I mean, the, the, um, the federal rule, it will include funding. And I think it's a starting point, um, in order for us to really be advancing our, um, our program, we're going to need that federal infrastructure, the federal support, um, and there are a couple of items in the, the proposed rule that could be big game changers for, for us in California if they're not changed. Like I know that the response times that are proposed um, for is immediate or seven days. Um, and of course, in, Ca in California, we have a 10 day um, standard for, uh, for cases that don't have immediate needs, right? So if that were to go forward, that would be very, very significant for us. And I think that we would need to leverage um, that change and, and really work with our state partners to make sure that there was um, funding or changes in, in other state requirements that would facilitate our ability to do that. Um, so I think we, we have to think, of, think about it as an opportunity um, and it's gonna be a new relationship. So um, one that we will have to, to cultivate and um, I'm excited for the, for the future to see what will happen. Thank you, Jill, and great question, Emily. Any other questions for Jill? And Jill's email address is here on the slide. It's also in the participant manual if you think of other questions after this as sometimes happens. Thanks, Dawn. Thank you so much, Jill.
Um, so now we'll move forward with our final um, presenter for, for this morning, Deborah Bates. Good morning, everyone. Um, Deborah Bates, uh, current interim director of healthcare agency in Orange County, former retired social services director in Orange County. Uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity. I also want to thank Jackie and Jill uh, for their amazing presentations and really think about, as I go through my slides, uh, look for the intersection points, look to where my cons the concepts I'll be talking about today and how they've highlighted those things into action. And so my goal today is really to talk about where innovative ideas or strategy and concepts really come from, who should be included as you formalize your plan, how do we tell our story, the importance of finding a champion or champions to build momentum and move into the action. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about building coalitions and action plans. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. So innovation really begins with ideation. Um, it's really the formation of ideas and concepts. And so strategy really begins with an idea or a concept or a goal. But where do, where, how do we generate those ideas? How do we generate those concepts? And so there's some buckets that, that I'm going to sort of highlight for you today. And I'm going to refer back to Jackie and Jill's presentations. But the first one is trends. It's important as leaders in adult services and APS to really understand the trends that are, are beginning to form within our industry, within our discipline, and what is happening at the federal, state, and local environments that impact the work we do. What is that ever-changing climate? Where is it going? And again, highlighting where are the opportunities in those trends? We are an aging population. We're seeing, as both Jackie, Angel, and Don alluded to, movement at the federal level, right? With the goal of creating national standards for APS, um, having common definitions, policies, and procedures that are person-directed, right? That are customized and individualized. Looking at data collection needs um, and training, both ongoing and, and requirements for ongoing education for APS. At the state level, Jackie did an amazing job to highlighting all the opportunities within the master plan on aging, which is our state's strategic plan and how to respond to the growing needs of our aging population. Uh, and finally, at the local level, what's happening in your own local environment? What's happening in our local environment? What did we learn in the pandemic? What did we learn in responding to the needs of our aging population through the pandemic? We saw the need to bring services into the community. We saw the need to have more targeted response to our aging population and campaigns and messaging like vaccinations, et cetera. We had to change the way we addressed food insecurity of our aging populations. Many of us, APS playing a role in that during home visitations, welfare checks, uh, many counties really shifted the way our adult services staff respond into, to our population. You see concepts of mobile response, alternatives to services. But we also learned really importantly through the pandemic, the importance of, of leveraging that first point of contact. And so again, it's important as leaders to keep updated on our current and anticipated trends because understanding the direction that we are moving toward gives us an opportunity to really start to think about the concepts in our ever-changing work environment and what, how do we need to shift our service delivery models to meet those trends proactively versus reactively. Our roles are important. Ideas come from understanding the roles we play and the roles we want to play. What role does APS and adult services play today? Where does APS fall in the continuum of care for our aging population and those with disability? Are we a downstream intervention when things become crisis or there's more support needed or there's more challenges for a community? What role can APS and adult services pay if we move upstream to more prevention oriented activities? Is there opportunities for new initiatives, um, new service delivery, new programs to deal more in prevention? Things like what role could we play in support of our stakeholders? Some examples of that are the concept of integrated case management. Um, we, Jackie talked about the master plan on aging, but also in support is CalAIM 
And Cal Lame really is driving the way adult services communicates and coordinates care with our managed care plans. It looks at how managed care plans can choose to supplement in-home supportive services. What does that mean? How does that work? How do we wrap services? This, housing insecurity. Some of our managed care plan have committed to addressing housing insecurities as well as food insecurities in our community as part of their, their community supports. How do we leverage those partnerships? How do we create new systems of flow? So that is important to understand um, where those opportunities exist. And, and also, what role do we as adult services and APS leaders really want to play post-intervention? Do, is there a role for us in ongoing support of our, our, of our populations? Is that something that we want to explore? Is that is that a possibility? Are there doors opening? I'm thinking of things like enhanced case management that maybe is six months post, you know, post intervention. This is how ideas are formed that really drives the innovation at the local link, uh, local level. Important to know is also what challenges. What do I mean by challenges? Is what struggles do we currently have today in the work we're trying to do, right? What barriers to the service currently exist? Is there opportunity to minimize those barriers or completely remove them? So those are things to think about from challenges. That's really what I mean, is what, what exists that prevents us as leaders to reaching the outcomes we really want to achieve? And that moves us into outcomes. What is it that we're trying to accomplish as adult services leaders? What goals do we have? How can we begin measuring them? Right. What do we want to accomplish in, in removing those? So think about that. And then really important today, because today is all about collaboration. And what I mean about collaboration is how do we share what we are doing across county lines and with our peer support group? What are other counties doing? Jill just highlighted a lot of things that the city and county of San Francisco are doing at their level. The master plan on aging also highlights other initiatives. Orange County is doing their first ever, they funded a master plan on aging countywide needs assessment so that they can start beginning to form and build their programs. So where do those opportunities lie across sharing great work that everybody's doing? How do you discuss opportunities or, or challenges that you're having? Are there opportunities? And, and I'm really glad that, you know, Jill mentioned the, the Bay Area Consortium in Southern County, there's also a consortium, but how do we do things together? Where's the opportunity to convene our peer counties or our, our neighboring counties to just do a, a date, you know, information sharing about things that are working, the challenges we're experiencing, and is there an opportunity to collectively work on regional solutions, right? Shared funding, et cetera. Those are things that I want you to think about. I know you're going to go into the breakout session today, but these are things about this is where you the ideas begin to form. And my favorite is the if only and wishes. How many times in any given day did you find yourself saying, if only we could? I wish we could. I wish we did. I wish we had, right? If only we worked better with A, B, and C. If only I had the freedom to do dot, dot, dot. One of the things that I've always done is I have a little notebook. And so whenever I have find myself saying, I wish I could, or if only, I usually do document that down as an idea that maybe later I want to revisit. But that really is how innovation begins. It begins with thinking about all of the things that impact the work you do, your trends, the role we play, the challenges we face, the outcomes we want to reach the importance of collaboration and team building and brainstorming and, and generating those ideas as a collective. And then also keeping in mind the things that you wished you could do if only you could. Next slide, please. Next slide. Sorry, can we go back to the previous one? I apologize. I went a little too fast today. There we go. And Jack, Jill sort of alluded to this. And, you know, the idea, you have an idea in your head, there's a concept you want to explore, but it all begins with clarity. And Jill sort of mentioned this. How many times have we gotten into a work group and no one really knows what the work group is supposed to accomplish today, right? We have an idea, but it hasn't been fully fleshed out. We're not clear of what we're trying to accomplish as a collective, 
Um, so it's really important to take a little bit of time to flush out that idea and, and gain some clarity. Be clear on the goals that you're trying to accomplish. Be clear on the problems you're trying to solve. Be clear on the impacts. And when I say impacts, sometimes what we do as leaders is we focus on one aspect or one avenue versus really looking at it from a, a hub and spoke. And it's important that we look look at impacts, not just from our own lens, but from the lens of others. What is the, if I move forward with this concept and idea, what are the potential impacts, uh, impacts to the service, to outcomes, to those we serve, to the stakeholders, to our staff, to our budget, to our resources. So really take some time to identify what potentially could be impacted if we move forward in this direction just so that you have an opportunity to address those things as you begin to form your idea into a concept, into an action. But also be clear on the environment you work with, right? Is there an appetite for this level of change? Is it a small change or a big change? Which stakeholders would love to see this move forward? Who's potentially going to be resistant, right? And ultimately, no idea goes anywhere without the support of others. So who should you involve? It's important to know the key stakeholders that you should engage. And don't, I challenge you not to just think about your, the traditional partners you have, but look at uh, partners you typically haven't engaged with into forming programs and solutions. You know, what about our off area, you know, our Meals on Wheels providers, those kind of, of partners. Look at all the stakeholders who would really love to see this move forward. Who do we really need to engage to make sure that we have their perspective? It's important that your leadership, that our higher level leadership, our boards of supervisors, see the benefits of moving forward. Can they get behind you? And then the one thing that often is always missed is administration. As you begin to take your ideas and you're clear on what you want to accomplish and you start to form the concepts, include administration staff early, include your budget, include your HR, include your IT, include your training department. Let them be involved as you go through your brainstorming and your formation of your work group so that they become an actual proactive partner. Um, I don't know about some of you in this room, but sometimes how often have we created a program only to find out there were barriers we didn't anticipate? We had to go back to the drawing board because we didn't really engage those key stakeholders early on. We didn't understand the funding limitations, right, or claiming issues. We, re we didn't realize that there was some HR needed to be engaged with labor. So it's important that as you go through um, this concept is that you really engage all of those key players um, in the formation of the program, no matter how small or how big. There's a role for that, for those stakeholders to play. Again, no great idea is fully executed without the support of others. In order for us to move our initiatives forward, our great strategies forward, we really need to have that as a collective uh, moving forward. And I, I wanna give you a quick example of something that's happening in the frame of equity in Orange County is our healthcare agency um, has an office of population health and they applied for the CDC equity grant and that grant was really based on strengthening our community to look at equity issues in our and it identified six vulnerable population and what we did was a small amount of that funding very small went to the CBOs to form collectives around a population and one of our collectives is our adult services and so all of the community-based organizations a large portion I believe there's 45 of them are part of that collective and what they were asked to do, we sort of gave them a small amount of funding, very small, to begin to create a governance structure around their collective, right? And at the end, they gave us a health equity plan for that particular population that looked at outreach, engagement, capacity building, data collection, right? And some great work is happening out of those collectives, and now they're in year two. And so that's a way of really engaging stakeholders and understanding this is also another opportunity for us to be able to leverage those partnerships and begin engaging stakeholders in ways that we haven't done with the lens of, of equity and inclusion. Next slide, please. But how do you get everybody there? How, how, how do we get moving? 
Well, it's important that we tell a story. It's important that APS and adult services is able to communicate effectively the work we do and the importance of the work we do, and also the importance of moving forward in the direction we'd like to see us go forward with. And a story ends and begins at connection. If your story cannot make a connection with your attendant audience, then we need to revisit how we're telling that story. And so as you're formalizing your story, I want you to think about your goal. I want you to think about what is it that you're trying to accomplish within that story. Initiatives require support and gaining momentum, securing funding. It's dependent on our ability to effectively tell our story. So be clear on the goal that you're trying to communicate. Think of your story as the plot when you already know the ending, right? You know what the ending is going to be, but now you need to build your story because if your ending is you want support and in moving an initiative forward, then how do you gather yourself to show the importance and the risks and the positive outcomes that could be achieved with moving in this particular direction? So think about your goal. It's also important that you tell your story in a way that's balanced. You, you want to be able to drive groups into action and gain support and momentum, but you need to find balance between the data, right? Data tells a story. And oftentimes as adult services leader, we don't fully leverage the data that we have as a way of telling a particular story. You want to include personal experiences, right? But you want to do that in a way that is also neutrally balanced. You want people to continue to understand your story because they need to find the ending for themselves. Does that make sense? And so it's knowing the audience because your story is going to have to shift. You know, we all went through high school and we had to do book reports. Some of us loved reading the entire book. Some of us were all about the cliff notes. Let's be honest, right? And so it's understanding the audience and how they're going to want and need to shift to receive your story in order to be able to move them forward. Be clear and be concise. People get lost in the words, right? People get lost in the theory and they get lost in a lot of words. So, so make sure that your story is a brief story. It's a short story. And so one of the reasons, an example I'll use of this, which I think is a really good example of, it comes back from my social services days and it has to do with Orange County wanting to implement the restaurant meals program in Cloud Fresh, right? Uh, and we knew that it was necessary not only to support the unhoused population, but also support our aging population because the goal was to get those um, seniors that are eligible to CalFresh enrolled, right? And we wanted to be able to give them different access points to nutritional food. And so we, the board at the time was very conservative and we had to tell a story and we had to think about it. And we stepped back as a collective and looked at what is the story of restaurant meals, right? What data do we have? Well, we knew the need by population within each of the county cities, right? We knew that. That was data we had accessible. We also knew how many of those segmented populations were currently enrolled in CalFresh, right? We also knew how many businesses, our environmental health knew exactly how many businesses were currently licensed that would meet the requirement for restaurant meals, right? And we also knew that the outcome um, was very positive and what the purpose and intent of the program. So that, that's what we did. We crafted a story. We wanted, at the end of the day, we needed the board to approve our policy moving forward to allow us to shift and to allow us to implement the program. So what we did is we looked at, all right, how do we tell the story of the population first? That's important. And so we broke down the population by individual supervisory districts. So they can see in their own district who is impacted by this program, who would have some positive outcomes, right? for this population in their in their immediate district. But we also did the economics for the supervisors that were more about business oriented. We did the economics of what this could drive in regards to additional revenues for these restaurant owners, right? And so, but we shifted. One supervisor, her whole platform was the aging population. It was her passion population. Every supervisor has a passion population, right? And so for her, we emphasized the story of the seniors. We showed how many seniors in her district suffered from food insecurity, right? We, we highlighted for her the eligible seniors that already existed. And then we showed how those seniors, what this meant, the support could mean in the life of a senior. And with telling that story, this is how we moved forward and got board support for our initiative moving forward. Next slide, please.
along with your story, you need to find a champion. You need to find a champion. The champion comes along on your journey, right? Initiative need drivers to move it along. Champions can do this for you, right? Whether, who do we need the buy-in from? And champions are great for getting people to follow and come along for the ride. I think it's important to know that. A champion can help you get where you need to go. Champions help build momentum around the issue. You heard a Jackie in her presentation, the M MPA and the stakeholders and those champions and keeping the momentum going. This is a great example of why finding a champion or champions. If it's an internal change that you're making, you need champions among the staff that understand the purpose that can help, over help you overcome resistance or concerns related to that. Anyone can be your champion, but think about who, should, who could you look at? Your executive leadership, champions among your staff, other county departments, external stakeholders, and boards of supervisors are all key champions for you. Um, when addressing food insecurity amongst our seniors in Orange County, we went to that supervisor where this is their passion population. And we highlighted for her the needs of where food insecurity resided and those seniors that potentially could be eligible for, for CalFresh that had taken advantage. The next thing you know, she was helping us design in some of our largest retirement communities, mobile response with our enrollers, with our food banks, where we the food brought the seniors out and we enrolled them in CalFresh, those were eligible and Orange County successfully had a really high enrollment of our seniors post SSI SSP. This is what a champion can do for you. So think about who should be your, your champion, whether they're internal or external drivers. Next slide, please. It's also important, you heard both Jackie and Jill mention the power of coalitions, the power of collaboratives, the power of work groups, right? It's important that we think about these things as we're building initiatives and our ideas are forming into concepts. You need to gather the players. You need to identify and recruit. Don't forget your administrative staff, who these players should be. Have the courage to go outside your normal circle of stakeholders. Diversity in thought brings passion, commitment, and it makes sure that you are looking at an issue from all aspects. Division early is key for a successful outcome because it gives you the opportunity to, to address the concerns that exist early on. It increases the buy-in. Once the group is together, you need to provide clarity on the goals and identify the benefits of reaching that common objectives. Jill alluded to that, you know, formed a work group, didn't really know what we needed to do. So we created a strategic plan. So this is the kind of the concept of be clear on the goals. You also need to define what, is, what we all have, what success will look like if we focus on the common objectives. Set your ground rules early and keep it moving. Develop formal action project plans. A project plan is really easy. You define the steps you need to take. You define your milestones. You assign timelines. You adjust as you go and you stay on track and keep your group accountable. It's also important for you to note that work continues post-implementation. And I think you heard this, um, Jill referred to a program in San Francisco that didn't pan out, but it was a pilot, right? Risk comes with holding a leadership position. There will always be risk in the things you want to try and the things you want to do. It's important to know the risks, but never let them paralyze you. Instead, mitigate those risks. Instead, look for solutions to minimize the risk that you're worried about. Work with your partners and stakeholders to see how you're ever going to come or minimize the, the negative impacts of that. But always be able and be courageous to know that you're going to have to adjust right? If you think about it as your idea or your concept as a prototype, before that invention ever hits the market, there's several prototypes that it goes through before it's ready for market. And so you need to think about your projects, your, your, your initiatives sort of in the same context and know that you're going to be adjusting and morphing and tweaking as you go through until you have a product that's finally ready to launch. And then you're going to learn a lot at implementation and you need to continue to launch it and adjust it as you go forward. 
And so that's the last thing I will uh, sort of leave you with is really about risk mitigation. Don't become risk paralyzed. Risks can be mitigated, right? As long as you understand them and you assess them. And that's where the power of the collectives can keep you going. And so with that, I will end my, my presentation. Are there any questions? Deborah, I think you've done the perfect job of teeing us up and getting us ready for the breakout groups. So there's a lot of um, lot of food for thought here, um, a lot of ideas that we've heard about um, the way that people have moved for taken gone from um, to you again use your your phrase, um, Deborah, gone from innovation to action, gone from the ideas the idea things to really move taking something to action. Um, so with that, I think we'll get get prepared for breakout groups. Um, Jill and Deborah and Jackie, thank you so much. Um, you're welcome to sign off as we get ready to to move into the next phase of the workshop, which is our breakout group activity. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy your breakout sessions. Thank, Thank you. you. So we have some um, discussion questions for you. There are a number of them. So um, you're likely not going to get to all of them. And the idea is, um, is not for you to cover all the questions, just to, um, to give you some, some ideas of discussion points, um, things, to, uh, things to discuss in your groups. And um, please do make sure that you exchange contact information. This is um, one of the, again, the building blocks of the Leaders Institute or the, um, the, the um, kind of priorities has been not only to, um, to impart information and help drive the field forward, also to provide an opportunity for you all to make connections across county to, um, to the people that really understand the, the work that you're doing. Um, We'll, we'll put this in the chat as well, so you don't have to try to memorize all of it. Um, it's also in your participant manual if you have that. Um, so when you go into your breakout groups, you know, do introduce yourselves. And then um, again, there, there are these um, dot points here for, uh, for ideas for, uh, for discussion points in your groups. Um, and Rabaz, I think that we're okay for um, 15 minute breakouts. Okay, we've got 15 minutes. And let me also stop recording now.